Good day, I'm Lisa Rowe and this is your JIS News for Wednesday, April 24, 2024. The government of Jamaica has confirmed its recognition of Palestine as a state. The country now joins 140 member states of the United Nations, UN, sharing this position. The information came from the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade on Monday via a press release following deliberations of the cabinet that same day. Portfolio Minister Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith says the decision is aligned with the country's strong commitment to the principles of the character of the United Nations. These principles, she indicates, seek to engender mutual respect and peaceful coexistence among states and the recognition of people's right to self-determination. Providing further context, the release says Jamaica is concerned about the war in Gaza, the ever-deepening humanitarian crisis, and advocacy for a peaceful resolution of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. The Foreign Affairs Minister reaffirms Jamaica's support for an immediate ceasefire, the release of hostages, and increased access to humanitarian aid for the people of Gaza. Finally, Minister Johnson Smith says Jamaica continues to advocate for a two-state solution as the only viable option to resolve the long-standing conflict. Jamaica also continues to support all efforts for de-escalation and the establishment of lasting peace in the region. The Jamaica Bauxite Mining Limited JBM is set to jumpstart a 445 million US dollar industrial project to boost agricultural development in rural areas. Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Mining Floyd Green made the announcement earlier today at the post-cabinet press briefing. Minister Green revealed that the initial phase of the 101 Industrial Park project would see the establishment of a development park in southeast St. Anne. To undertake the project, he said the ministry would utilize mining land formerly owned by Reynolds Industrial Park that is now in ruins. Construction and rehabilitation of the site is expected to run for 9 to 12 months. We'll be doing warehousing, we'll be looking to position that area as a pathway to economic prosperity. We do see an employment factor of about 100 jobs directly, and this is just phase one. Stressing the importance of this initiative, Minister Green says the project will also offer aspiring farmers access to land at a reduced rate. Meanwhile, he says the ministry is also in the early stages of developing a commercial zone and a housing complex, which will be revealed later this year. Two critical pieces of legislation have been tabled in Parliament with amendments to support the minimum wage increase that takes effect on June 1. They are the National Minimum Wage Amendment Order 2024 and the Minimum Wage Industrial Security Guards Amendment Order 2024. The motion was moved by Minister of Labor and Social Security Pernell Charles Jr. on Tuesday. The national minimum wage will increase to $15,000 per 40-hour work week. This rate is the same for the industrial security guards. Similarly, for work done during any period not exceeding 40 hours, that will move to $375 per hour. In relation to time and a half, there has been an increase to $562.50 per hour for work done in excess of 40 hours in any week. Double time will increase to $750 per hour for work done on a rest day or on a public holiday. I want to use this opportunity to appeal and to strongly urge all employers, particularly those with the means to do so, to offer their workers compensation that exceed the minimum threshold. And I want to use the opportunity as well to applaud all of those employers who are already doing so. The government has filed an appeal to resolve the retirement age dispute in a recent court ruling concerning the tenure of Paula Llewellyn as a country's director of public prosecutions, DPP. Last Friday, the Constitutional Court struck down an amendment that allowed Mrs. Llewellyn to elect to stay in office beyond her 63rd birthday as unconstitutional. The court upheld the constitutional amendments confirming the valid extension of the retirement age for these positions to 65 years. Despite this affirmation, the court ruled that the current DPP, Paula Llewellyn, could not remain in her position until age 65 
creating a significant contradiction within its verdict. The government says it remains committed to ensuring that statutory and constitutional amendments serve their intended purposes without ambiguity. Mrs. Llewellyn has since vacated the role. Senior Deputy DPP Claudette A. Thompson has been appointed to act as the Director of Public Prosecutions. The Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, says the government is fully dedicated to ensuring an efficient procurement system through the streamlining of the processes. Minister Clark says the aim is to ensure equity, value for money, transparency, fairness, reliability and economic growth. We are going to take out one of the layers in the system by abolishing the sector committees which we found to be redundant in, in effect and practice. We are also going to increase the thresholds and the third hard change that will be made is to abolish the mandatory 10-day standstill period. The finance minister was speaking at the opening of the Elevate Procurement Conference held at the Montego Bay Convention Center on Tuesday. The minister further states that the Office of Public Procurement Policy will publish benchmark timelines for the different stages of the procurement process. This aims to set clear expectations and improve accountability. And the good news with an electronic procurement system we will be able to measure and report on how entities are performing with respect to these benchmarks. And finally, government lawmakers paid a glowing tribute to retired Clark to the Houses of Parliament, Valerie Curtis, during Tuesday's sitting of the lower house. Prime Minister Andrew Holness recalled Ms. Curtis's guidance and expertise in navigating the complexities of parliamentary procedures. Our retired clerk was again an indispensable and invaluable resource in ensuring that the order of the house in terms of its business and procedures was well maintained. Tributes continued with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Juliet Holness, and Leader of Government Business, Edmund Bartlett. She has commendably led her staff in providing the necessary procedural and administrative support to the members of both houses. During her time at Parliament, Ms. Curtis displayed a commitment to upholding parliamentary ideals even as she displayed a people-centered approach to parliamentary administration. Ms. Curtis operated at the national level, providing sound procedural advice and being a competent administrator. Prior to her appointment as a clerk of the House of Representatives in July 2021, Ms. Curtis was the acting clerk in 2020 and deputy clerk in 2006. She was conferred with the Badge of Honor for Meritorious Service and the Order of Distinction Commander Class for her service to the Parliament of Jamaica in 2014 and 2020, respectively. Prime Minister Holness noted that Ms. Curtis had earned the respect and admiration of her colleagues and the nation. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Lisa Rowe. Thanks for watching.